Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solution Center in partnership with Enerdata. And today's webinar is focused on energy efficiency and transport, looking at successes and failures. And one important note of mention before we begin the presentation is that the Clean Energy Solution Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center's resource library as one of many best practices, resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And before we begin, I just want to go over some of the webinar features. You do have two options for audio. You may either listen through your computer or call in over the telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please go to the audio pane in the GoToWebinar and select the mic in speakers option. That will just help eliminate any uh, echo or feedback. And if you choose to dial in by phone, uh, simply select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the number and audio pin that you should use to dial in. And if anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinar's help desk at the number displayed at the bottom of the slide. That number is 888. 259-3826. And so we do encourage anyone from the audience to ask questions at any point. We do keep all attendees on mute, so to ask a question, simply type it into the question pane and submit it there. And if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, we will be posting PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as our speakers present. Also, an audio recording of the presentation will be posted to the Solution Center training page within about a week of today's broadcast. And just a reminder, we're also adding the recordings to the Solution Center YouTube channel, where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. And today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Bruno Lapalone and Karina Sebi. These panels have been kind enough to join us to review the various policy measures implemented in the transport sector, such as minimum energy performance standards, labels, and promotion of modal shifts. Within the European Union and in G20 countries, and to relate them to energy demand growth and energy efficiency improvement. Now, before the speakers begin their presentations, I'll provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solution Center initiative. Then following the presentations, we will have a the question and answer session where I'll uh, present the panelists with any questions submitted by the audience, followed by closing remarks, and then a very brief survey. Now this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be formed. The Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April 2011, and it's primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning training tools such as the webinar you are attending today. And there's four primary goals for the Solution Center. First goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. Third is to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. And the primary audience for the Solution Center are energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries, but we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. And one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides is the no-cost expert policy assistance, known as Ask an Expert. And the Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are each available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So, for example, in the area of low-emission vehicles, we're very pleased to have Ted Sears, a senior project leader at the National Renewable Energy Lab, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in low emission vehicles or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this valuable service. And again, it is provided to you free of charge. So if you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. Or to find out how the Ask an Expert service can benefit your work, uh, feel free to contact me, Sean Esterly, directly at seanesterly, sean.esterly, at nrel.gov, or at 
384-7436. Uh, those are also displayed on the slide that's currently being shown. And we also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. So now I would like to provide brief introductions for today's panelists. Uh, first up today is Bruno Lacaloni, Vice President and Co-Founder of Enerdata. And Bruno is a globally recognized expert of energy efficiency and demand, energy supply and demand, and policy monitoring and evaluation. And then following Bruno, we will hear from Corrine Sebi, a project manager and energy efficiency specialist from Enerdata. And Corrine specializes in energy efficiency and participates in various European and French projects on energy efficiency. She served as a technical coordinator on the Odyssey project for the European Commission. She also worked on experimental economic public policy assessment and demand. And with those introductions, I'd now like to welcome Bruno to the webinar. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, to start with, uh, we'll say a few words about uh, Enerdata. Uh, which is a company of about 40 people uh, with the office in uh, Grenoble, in uh, France, in Paris, and in Singapore. Uh, we are working quite a lot on energy efficiency and demand issue, and it's what we will present in this webinar, but we are also uh, involved in the world modeling of oil and uh, gas supply, power supply, as well as the carbon market. The source of information that uh, we we'll use for this webinar relies on uh, various projects that uh, we have carried out for ADEME, the French Agency for Energy Efficiency and Environment, uh, for which we have been looking both at the trend in energy efficiency indicators and uh, also at policy evaluation. This includes the uh, European project uh, Odyssey and MUR. Odyssey is an indicator MUR in the policy. Um, you will have the link uh, behind uh, the, this different project. A project of the World Energy Council looking at energy efficiency worldwide, also uh, on the aspect of uh, quantitative trends in terms of uh, energy efficiency indicators and policies evaluation. And as a project focusing on G20 countries for uh, IPEC and uh, also uh, the there are always the two dimensions. And the fourth uh, project is more on policy, which was to identify the most interesting uh, and innovative uh, policy practice in Europe. Most of these projects cover the whole sectors, but here we'll focus on transport. So the presentation will start uh, with the presentation of the main energy efficiency or energy consumption trend in transport will follow with an overview of uh, policies and then we'll go into more details uh, with uh, policies in different areas and my colleague Karin uh, will spend some time in uh, presenting the different uh, measures trying to improve the improvement of the different modes of transport and then I will uh, conclude with other policies and uh, the main conclusion about the success and failures of the policy. We'll illustrate this presentation with uh, numbers uh, from the G20 to reduce the number of countries, but uh, very often we, have, we try to have a worldwide view, or in Europe we try to, to look at each country individually. Uh, G20 countries represent about 80% uh, of uh, the world energy consumption. And the first slide uh, shows what is the importance of transport in the final energy consumption. Uh, of the different uh, countries. It represents about 25% for G20 and a rather stable share. In other countries, as you can see, the, the share of transport is, has a different scope. It's uh, quite uh, important in USA, Mexico, uh, Brazil or uh, Australia, but quite small in China and India, but increasing. In EU countries, the trend is generally to have a lower share of, uh, of transport in, in some countries like uh, Germany or uh, Italy. Uh, one word about the definition of transport. According to IEA, uh, transport does not include the uh, consumption for international air transport, which is not negligible and is growing very fast. If we were to include this uh, 
this international air transport, this would raise the, the consumption to 27% at the G20 uh, and for all countries it would increase, of course, the share of transport. Then, um, there are large disparities, as can be shown from the graph on the, on the left, in, in terms of energy consumption per capita for transport, uh, with very small numbers for uh, Asian countries, India, Indonesia, China, around 0.2 kiwi per capita, which can be compared to the countries on the right, which are close to 2 kiwi uh, per capita, which means that they consume 10 times more. This implies that there is still a large potential for growth in the countries from the left, which doesn't mean they will uh, uh, catch up with the, the countries from the right, but clearly the consumption is going to, to increase. In uh, non-OECD countries, there is an increasing trend in the consumption of transport that is uh, driven by uh, the economic growth, the ownership of cars and increased traffic which is about 5% per year in Asia, but there are countries where this consumption is decreasing, which is the case of uh, most non-OECD countries, and I will come back to that uh, later. This decrease is partly linked to energy efficiency improvement, and we have tried, for, in the case of Europe, to quantify what was the role of energy efficiency, and I will present that in the conclusion. If we keep uh, the definition of uh, IEA, uh, road represents about 90% of the consumption in, in G20 and uh, dominant share in uh, all countries. Only in Russia, China or India, rail transport is important. Air transport, which only includes domestic air transport, is uh, not so important here. And so we'll mainly focus on the road transport in our presentation. The transport consumption is uh, decoupled from economic growth. If we see, for instance, for G20, uh, the uh, consumption is growing, which is shown in blue, is growing much less rapidly than the uh, economic growth which is shown by the GDP in green, which means that the energy intensity of the transport consumption per unit of uh, GDP is decreasing, which is shown by the red line. And on the left side, you can see the different situation of countries. Uh, its uh, value of the intensity in 2013 in index with 100 in 2000. So all countries that are below 100, which is majority of countries, are countries where we have this decoupling with the concentration of transport growing much lower than GDP. Only in a few countries, in Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, the consumption is growing faster than GDP. We, this is not shown in the graph, but there are quite uh, different levels of transport intensity, even uh, measured with purchasing power parities, with a factor 4 between, uh, for instance, India and Canada, that are the two extremes of, of the values. Transport is still uh, strongly uh, dependent on oil, although there are policies to to replace oil with alternative fuels, which means two things. Uh, the transport sector has an increasing influence on the oil market, but on the other side, the oil market and the change in international oil price have an important impact on the transport sector. Despite uh, a general progression of alternative fuels that is shown on the right side, alternative fuels are biofuel and natural gas, the uh, dependence of the sector on oil is still above 90% uh, G20 level with very different situation with countries like uh, Argentina, Brazil or France that have high penetration of alternative fuels. In the case of France and Brazil it is uh, biofuel, in the case of Argentina it is uh, natural gas. Let's go now to the policies. Um, usually we consider there are three levels of uh, action for policymakers in terms of uh, changing the pattern of energy demand in the, in the transport sector. The first one is to improve the efficiency of the different modes and or shifting to, to alternative fuels. 
which include measures to improve the vehicle efficiency, the promotion of alternative fuels or soft measure like uh, eco-driving. And as you will see, this represents the majority of the measures that have been involved. The second level uh, in green uh, imply changing the type of mode that are being used and this is already a policy that is uh, in between energy and transport sector. And the third level is reducing transport demand, which is a measure that is uh, a policy that will combine different dimensions, uh, which goes from energy, transport, and urbanization. This, uh, for the last type of measures, these are measures that can only be considered in the long term, and we have few examples of uh, such policies because it, it implies a, a good cooperation between different areas. Based on a survey we have carried out for the World Energy Council in 2012, which covered uh, all countries in the world, you, you have only a sample for uh, some uh, G20 countries, but uh, everything can be found on the uh, WEC uh, energy policy database or on the WEC report. Uh, what came out is that the regulations are the dominant measure. Regulation include the mandatory label or minimum energy efficiency or CO2 emission standard for cars. Then we have financial and fiscal measures that represent each on average 20 percent. Here we do not include the measure of fuel pricing and taxation because in principle uh, a lot of countries are having such policies. Almost all OECD countries have high tax on uh, motor fuels. It is clear this is a prerequisite for the success of energy efficiency policy in transport, giving a good signal to the user of the different modes of vehicle, modes of transport. If we look at uh, AU countries where we are using a, a different database that is called MURE, and you have the link here, it is possible to go into more details as to the distribution of measure by mode and type of uh, actions. And it turns out that about half of the measures are uh, addressing the improvement of the efficiency of cars or reducing the emission of cars that goes together. 20% are dealing with improving the efficiency of other modes, uh, trucks, light duty vehicles, buses, airplanes, trains. And about 15% of the measures are dealing with model shift for passengers. Uh, about 10 percent are dealing with driver behaviors and uh, or eco driving and uh, what is surprising is that model shift for goods only uh, represent less than five percent of the measures then uh, my colleague will continue by uh, focusing on measure on energy efficiency improvements thank you Bruno for this uh, introduction I think that now we have a clear understanding of the main uh, trends in terms of uh, energy consumption in transport and you uh, presented the main policies and instruments that uh, government can implement and uh, so you just explained that uh, the energy consumption in transport is, is decreasing uh, since 2000 in some countries and um, this is mostly due to a greater diffusion of uh, more efficient road vehicles driven by the implementation of uh, measures, uh, like you said, regulation and incentive measures. And the aim of this uh, section is to provide you a glimpse uh, of the measures implemented in uh, road transport, because as you explained, it represents uh, the large majority of uh, transport energy consumption. First, um, I'll present measures uh, targeting cars uh, that are the major mode in road transport and then measures uh, targeting uh, transport of goods. Then Bruno will present you uh, measures on model shift that aim to decrease the individual uh, transport of uh, goods and passengers. Uh, just a remark, um, I'll uh, illustrate uh, measures implemented in some countries as an example, but in any case the list of countries I mentioned is, is exhausted. So um, this Sorry, yes, this one first. <laughs> this slide um, uh, lists the main uh, instruments that are implementing to improve energy efficiency uh, of cars. And um, implementers have a set of policy instruments. And there is a combination of measures 
increasingly conceived as packages to improve the energy efficiency of new vehicles, most often cars. And among these measures, we have first the energy labels, the labeling, that aim to uh, increase the number of efficient cars by raising awareness about vehicle energy concept performance or consumption and uh, allowing comparison across all models and technologies. The fuel consumption or the CO2 emission of cars per kilometer um, are displayed on this level during the sales. Most, G most uh, G20 countries have uh, energy efficiency levels for cars and one of the latest implemented uh, was in Saudi Arabia uh, that uh, they implemented a level that have been uh, mandatory for new cars and light uh, commercial vehicles in August 2014. Uh, however, some countries have not yet implemented uh, this label, like uh, in Argentina, Indonesia, Russia, or in Turkey. Uh, in Brazil and in India, for instance, the energy levels for, for cars are voluntary. Then there is a second uh, measure that mentioned uh, Bruno, and uh, which is really important, is the minimum energy performance standards, in short, MEPS, or we uh, call them as well the fuel efficiency uh, standard that are implemented to stop production or to stop import of inefficient uh, vehicles. Uh, most of the time, uh, the standards are expressed in terms of fuel amount in liter or in CO2 emission, like a gram CO2 per kilometer. Um, in case of non-compliance with the standards, the manufacturers are obliged to pay a fine or tax that is generally uh, proportional to the amount of extra CO2 produced uh, or to the shortfall of fuel efficiency. <coughs> the third item, you, you see that uh, you can, the government can imply uh, fuel uh, taxes on motor fuels. <coughs> the energy consumption of cars is uh, also driven by cars, of course, and uh, government apply uh, fuel taxes on motor fuel to decrease energy consumption or uh, average uh, distance or to give incentive as well uh, at long term to, uh, to end user to buy more uh, efficient uh, uh, cars or equipment. Uh, the fourth item, you have the efficiency or CO2 based tax on cars. Uh, so indeed to uh, reduce the CO2 emission on, uh, of fuel consumption, government often opt for tax uh, that are based on fuel efficiency, which is measured in uh, liters per 100 kilometers. And finally, you have uh, the, all the financial uh, subsidies uh, scheme or any premium to promote uh, alternative motors like uh, uh, hybrid or electric uh, vehicles. Uh, on this slide, this is exactly the same type of uh, slide as presented Bruno from the World Energy Council uh, report that uh, we, um, we, we did uh, in 2012. Here it focuses only in the G20 uh, countries and on the measures implemented on cars. And this slide provides you the number uh, of measures per, per type, that is to say either a regulation, fiscal or financial uh, measures. And one can easily see, as explained Bruno, that uh, regulations are uh, the, the dominant measures implemented. Indeed, uh, 13 uh, G20 countries uh, implemented levels on car, and 50% uh, have a fuel efficiency uh, standard. Then uh, come the fiscal uh, measures, that is to say the, the taxes I presented you. This slide uh, provides you um, some examples of energy levels uh, that are implemented uh, in some uh, G20 uh, countries. Uh, uh, in total, 13 G20 countries have implemented uh, this uh, level, so this most, most uh, majority. Although there is uh, unfortunately not much uh, harmonization in the approaches yet. For instance, uh, Australia fuel consumption level, which is uh, mandatory since 2009, uh, is not comparative at the EU uh, level, but <clears throat> it does clearly display uh, urban, rural, and combined fuel test uh, consumption, as well as combined test CO2 emissions. The European uh, level, 
so in 2000, the EU Parliament uh, introduced uh, that leveling uh, legislation. And for instance, uh, Finland, the Netherlands, France, and the UK have adopted a scaled comparative label. This label has a CO2 uh, based color code band system, which is similar to uh, energy efficiency levels uh, applied on appliance, appliances. Uh, then the last um, example I can um, describe is a Chinese one. So even if it's in Chinese, I can explain you that uh, uh, this fuel consumption level uh, has been um, on mandatory since uh, January uh, 2010. Uh, it includes uh, as the Australian one uh, city highway, uh, highway and combined fuel consumption. It displays uh, other type of information like the vehicle name, model type, engine type, and so on. But this level doesn't show uh, the CO2 emissions, for instance. So you see that uh, the, there is an increasing awareness about vehicle energy performance, uh, but the countries uh, do not use the same um, yeah, methodology. Um, of course, these uh, measures uh, target many cars, but uh, they have been uh, recently uh, extend uh, to uh, other type of uh, vehicles. Uh, so let's focus on uh, labeling. Um, and uh, for instance, the labeling have been extended to, uh, to van, for instance, in Denmark or in France, uh, or to used car, or uh, labels are proposed for cars rental in France. But uh, there is uh, other extension to a car component. Indeed, um, car energy losses uh, do not stem only from engines, and a significant proportion of losses occurs in the power given the wheels. And some countries uh, introduced levels on tire efficiency, which is the case uh, in 2012 in, in Europe, or in the USA it has been uh, implemented since uh, 2007. Uh, other labeling uh, provide as well some uh, monetary unit, that is to say the, the amount of uh, savings you can gain from uh, this, uh, this uh, level. There is uh, other uh, regulation and uh, there is um, in particular extension of uh, maps to uh, other vehicles. So that's true that commonly the same standard is applied to uh, both cars and light vehicle, uh, commercial vehicles. But EU and Japan distinguish these two types and have different standards for passenger cars and light commercial vehicles. While Canada and USA claims combine an average target for passenger car and light commercial vehicles, although separate targets uh, for each category are also uh, stated. Heavy duty vehicle standards also exist in Canada, China, Japan and uh, USA. Uh, the tire pressure monitoring uh, system, TPMS, uh, increases the fuel efficiency of vehicles by providing the drivers with the information of uh, air pressure in the tires. And these measures uh, have been, uh, has been implemented in the EU, USA and Korea, uh, for instance, and it is planned to be implemented in Russia in um, 2016. About uh, the financial and fiscal incentive that aim to, uh, to boost uh, the, the, the car market, they are indeed put in place uh, in order to promote the purchase and the production of uh, in energy efficient or alternative uh, fuel vehicles. Fiscal incentives such as purchase or annual regi registration tax reduction for efficient vehicles have uh, became, uh, become frequent uh, in G20 countries after uh, 2000. So um, the, um, the measures targeting uh, like a higher tax on the purchase of fuel inefficient uh, vehicles uh, is implemented in uh, a lot of uh, G20 uh, countries to promote efficient cars or to discourage ownership of uh, cars with low fuel efficiency. Uh, for instance, in Canada, excess tax on fuel inefficient vehicle is applied uh, at purchase since 2007. In China, the excess tax depends only on the engine size. 
In USA, the gas global tax is collecting uh, from manufacturer, and there is uh, many other examples uh, on this uh, excess tax implemented uh, worldwide. Um, there is as well some combined tax, like in France, uh, we have a, a mixed com concept of tax for inefficient car and incentives for efficient cars known as the bonus malus system. Uh, cars with low emission uh, get a subsidy or premium, a bonus, while cars with high CO2 emissions have to pay a tax, a malus. And you will see on the next slide the impact of the, these measures that have been implemented first in 2008 during uh, several months. And then there, is a, there was a second round in 2012 where we clearly see the impact on the, on the market, on the car market. Uh, as well, most EU countries like uh, Germany apply a, redu a reduction of annual regi registration tax based on CO2 emission of cars. Uh, about the, the incentive gave to uh, electric uh, vehicle, in Italy the annual registration tax exemption is, is applied to uh, only electric car for the five year after registration and the level of the fee depends on the engine size, emission standards and the region. In India as well there is uh, some tax exemption, exemption or uh, reduction and they are common in several states for electric cars. Then there are always, as well uh, some uh, tax for extra uh, emissions like in uh, South Africa and uh, where the new cars with uh, any extra emission over 120 uh, grams CO2 per kilometer are taxed at a rate of uh, $9 per um, uh, extra gram kilometer since 2010. Then um, some G20 countries give a financial uh, incentive for efficient car purchase. However, they are less common than uh, fiscal incentive. Uh, and for instance, the, the subsidy schemes for electric and hybrid cars are even efficient cars to increase their share on the market uh, are uh, widely implemented, uh, like in Japan, China, or uh, UK. And then there is this last uh, scheme I uh, put on that slide, uh, which is as well another type of incentive, uh, which is the scrapage uh, schemes that aim to accelerate efficient uh, car markets. Uh, indeed, uh, brands are offered, uh, distributed to, uh, to owners of old cars that buy new efficient ones. Uh, eligibility criteria and program contents differ from country to country. Uh, some require, for instance, uh, new car eligibility or other provide public transport uh, allowance rather than subsidizing the new car purchase, such as in Canada and Italy. So many, many countries implemented this kind of uh, scrapage uh, scheme. Uh, however, the, the implementation of such scheme uh, often implies negative externality and only temporarily uh, and boost only temporarily the car market toward um, efficient vehicles. So on that slide, uh, as I explained you previously, uh, we uh, showed the, the impact of the bonus malus program implemented in France. So the, the graphic shows the, um, the average uh, uh, CO2 emission of the car stock that is sold each year. So it concerns mainly new cars. And you can see that uh, the first cycle showed the, the impact of the, the first uh, round of the bonus manus implemented in 2008, where you see there is a, a drop, a decrease in this average, uh, and it leads to a, a continuously decrease toward the second uh, uh, round of the, of the program in 2012. Uh, what happened uh, on, the, on the specific consumption uh, of, uh, of new cars? Uh, of course, these uh, measures have a, have a positive impact uh, uh, and uh, there is a very strong effect uh, of the, the standard and the incentive measures of our new cars. As we can see, there is a rapid decrease on the specific consumption of new cars in most countries due to these policies. 
Uh, and this trend will continue in the next decade, given the, the existing standard, uh, where we have uh, some information uh, until uh, up to, uh, to 2025. And uh, so there is a positive impact of standard and incentive on new cars, and as well on the car store. Uh, indeed, the, the drop in uh, there is a drop in energy consumption per car, which is mainly explained by uh, an increased energy efficiency of the vehicle stock, which itself is a result of the diffusion of the of more efficient new cars, as I just uh, explained. For instance, on average, uh, specific consumption decreased by uh, 1.2 percent per year in, in the EU since uh, since a, dec a decade. And uh, in addition to uh, uh, regulation and taxes on vehicles, the energy consumption of cars, as I said previously, is driven by prices. Um, unfortunately, only a few countries in the G20 uh, produce annual data on the energy use of cars. Of cars, sorry. But from the, um, the data available, uh, one can see there is an obvious uh, negative correlation between um, the energy consumption per car and the motor fuel price. Indeed, higher fuel prices imply more efficient, more energy efficient cars and lower distance travel per car. And the European countries with uh, prices uh, significantly higher than in uh, other countries have the lowest energy consumption per car. So let's now turn to uh, the um, transport of goods or road freight transports. Uh, and the measures that are implemented in that uh, sector. So we present here the main uh, regulation and measures uh, that aim to improve uh, energy efficiency of uh, transport companies. Uh, policies on eco-driving, awareness campaigns and programs of development of rail road transport infrastructure contribute to improve the specific conception of road freight services. Several countries have implemented regulation for transport companies, such as mandatory audit, energy managers, energy consumption reporting, energy saving plans, or eco-driving. There is as well some uh, energy efficiency uh, obligation or white uh, certificate implemented uh, in the transport uh, sector. Indeed, uh, in the framing of the European energy, uh, energy Efficiency Directive, some EU countries, such as France, for instance, implemented uh, measures to establish energy efficiency obligation. And the goal is to drive uh, forward energy efficiency improvements in the household, business, industry, and transport sector. But, but um, transport-wide uh, certificates are marginal in France and represents roughly 2% of all white certificates distributed um, uh, per year. But uh, I will provide you some examples of measures that are implemented in the frame of the energy efficiency obligation in France. So it includes uh, uh, equipment and services measures. Uh, transport equipment measures include model shift, uh, bus uh, tires with lower rolling resistance, uh, uh, vehicle replacement with replacement with more efficient vehicle ones and so on. And the transport service uh, measures include training of uh, public road transport driving to eco drive, uh, carpool from uh, home to work journeys and so on. There are as well voluntary agreements uh, with uh, transport companies. Uh, programs toward op optimization of supply chains and carry more approaches are the measures that uh, addresses uh, transport companies toward increasing the efficiency of uh, road freight transport. Although the, um, the effectiveness of uh, voluntary agreements can be uh, very dependent of uh, circumstances, and they are useful as setting some sectoral targets and contributing to energy efficiency in case of uh, sufficient participation. For instance, France has implemented, uh, introduced a, a voluntary agreement charter in 2008 and details a target CO2, CO2, target CO2 carrier undertake. There, are, there is as well some uh, fees or tolls for trucks uh, that are function of the efficiency or emission of vehicles. 
which is the case in Germany, uh, Switzerland, Latvia or, or Poland. And uh, last but not the least, there is some uh, measures uh, increasing the fleet efficiency besides fuel efficiency. It is possible with, uh, to improve the carrying capacities and uh, optimize uh, routing. USA, Canada and Australia have eco-combi trucks which are more than uh, 25 meters and carry uh, 60 tons at a time. There is as well similar uh, measures implemented in Europe, but it concerns uh, truck carrying a maximum 40 uh, tons uh, at a time. In terms of trends in uh, freight transport, the unit conception of uh, road freight transport at 10 kilometers provide an assessment of the energy efficiency of uh, freight transport services. As shown in this slide, there is a decreasing trend in the unit consumption of road freight transport in most countries thanks to the more efficient vehicles and the better fleet management or increased uh, load factors. The load factor is measured here by the average traffic in 10 kilometers carried by each truck per year. It increases because each truck is on average better loaded or because of a reduction in empty running. However, we can see that there is a reverse trend recently in some EU countries such as UK, Italy or even in USA since 2007 because of the, um, the economic uh, recession. Uh, so now I will, uh, Bruno will uh, finish the policy measure presentation with the model shift uh, policies. So this relates to the second type of policy I mentioned in the introduction, uh, which is more a policy uh, for, for the transport minister and not for the energy minister, which uh, makes it sometimes difficult uh, to implement and, uh, and it could be even in some countries that policies in terms of model shift do not go in the right direction because they have uh, different objectives. So what, what is aimed by a model shift is to shift for passenger traffic uh, part of the traffic from cars to public transport, uh, for instance to a bell rate transport like metro, tram, or to rapid bus system which is very popular in uh, Latin American countries, or high speed trains like in France, China, uh, Spain and so on. The second level is to uh, shift part of the freight traffic from trucks to rail and water transport through the development of uh, appropriate infrastructure and mainly infrastructures that uh, allow the combined uh, transport of uh, rail and what we call combined rail and road transport which means putting trucks on train or trucks on boats which uh, limit the, the break of, uh, of transport uh, for the delivery to the final consumers. But uh, there exist strong barriers and uh, uh, long delays to implement such measures because it goes through investment and uh, this doesn't happen uh, very uh, quickly and very easily. The measures that are implemented to promote model shifts are of different kinds. The first one is to limit the use of a car or limit uh, private car ownership to reduce the number of cars. Limiting car use can be done by uh, special fees uh, in uh, urban areas. This is the case in London or in, uh, in several cities in Norway or in Stockholm. To provide a disadvantage to the use of car uh, with uh, limiting the, the, the place for cars by putting bus lanes instead of uh, place for roads for cars, parking charge, restricting uh, in, in parking, incentives to carpooling and car sharing which should reduce the number of cars on the road but this is still limited but there are a lot of uh, uh, small measures to, to encourage that. And the third measure, which uh, has been implemented only in a few countries, but can have a strong impact, especially in emerging countries, is to limit car ownership, uh, which is what is done in China in Beijing city, where the number of cars, the new car on the road, is limited through a, a mixed system of uh, lottery and, and tax. Or another uh, 
policy that has been implemented in Europe for a long period already, in Denmark, where there are very, very high tax, which uh, is clearly a disadvantage. Uh, we, as a result, the number of car per capita in Denmark is among the lowest in uh, Europe, although Denmark is among the richest country. Then for a transport of goods, uh, there can be incentives to uh, put, to carry the, the, the freight by water or rail transport. First of all, by taxing the transport by trucks, this is uh, the system of toll uh, that mentioned Karin, uh, which will increase the, the, the cost of, of transportation. What she mentioned is that at the same time, the tolls can be linked to the efficiency of vehicles, so you can have a double effect, increase the efficiency of truck and uh, reduce the traffic. And there are several countries in Europe that have implemented this system. France tried to do it, but that was a failure and could not be, was not accepted. So it has been, the measure has been uh, scratched. There can be also incentive for companies to use railways instead of a road, like in Australia, for instance, or other countries as well. All that implies that also infrastructure for alternative modes to, to road are, are built and uh, development of public transport infrastructure, development of high-speed uh, train to substitute uh, air transport to attract the user of cars. And uh, we have also to, to note that uh, even if this is a wishful uh, uh, policy, there are Policy. There are several countries where the infrastructure of rail transport is still limited, uh, given the size of the country, and which uh, limits the possibility of uh, just thinking of model shift in, uh, the, in, in the transport sector. What are the results? The results are not so positive. We can see here how the share of public transport for passenger traffic uh, has changed over time. Uh, what can be seen already is that in countries where cars were not developed, like China or to a lesser extent in, in Russia, there have been a big decrease in the share of public transport when people could afford to buy cars or have access to cars, they, uh, they quickly uh, shifted from use of public transport to the use of cars and this, uh, the impact is shown on, on the graph. And in many other countries, the OECD countries, the uh, share of uh, public transport is, is decreasing as well. We can note, however, that in UK, France or Italy, uh, the share of public transport is increasing. So this is a positive sign. It's mainly linked to uh, the development of uh, rail uh, transport, intercity inter uh, rail transport or uh, uh, metro, uh, tram in the cities, but this is still limited and at AU level uh, I think there are less than one third of countries where we see this trend. With respect to the transport of uh, freight, well the picture is even uh, more uh, uniform in the sense that in most countries, I think except uh, Mexico and uh, UK, but they are already at a very low level, the share of rail and water is uh, decreasing. Uh, in some countries, the uh, traffic of goods by rail or water transport is uh, quite uh, significant, uh, above 60 percent in Russia, Korea, Canada, USA and Australia. This can be seen as a good practice, but is also explained by the fact they have to carry quite heavy goods like coal in Russia or in China or in India which, uh, uh, which are mainly transported by rail and water and which over uh, size uh, the, the weight of uh, rail transport. Now the conclusion, uh, the title of the presentation was about success and failures. So what are the success and what are the failures? First of all, the first success is that the energy consumption is decreasing in most OECD countries and this is explained by energy efficiency, not only, as we will see later. Also by lower distance travel that are linked to higher price of fuel, which is the result of higher tax but also the higher uh, price on the international market. This is true until uh, 2013. Now the price has decreased. 
and the other driver was the lower activity linked to the economic recession in OECD countries. Well, in non-OECD countries, we have a different picture, which we can call a failure, but it's not fully a failure. It's economic growth is positive, very positive. And in this country, the consumption is growing quite rapidly, as we have seen at the beginning. And uh, this is partly due to the economic growth and also to the fact that uh, more people have access to cars. Other success is the penetration of alternative fuel that is uh, working, but slowly. And this is uh, some kind of failure that there is still a strong relation to oil in transport. Everybody is talking about the future of electricity in transport, but we have to admit that the electrification of transport is still uh, far from uh, what we, we could expect, and it is less than 2% in 2012. I think in European countries it is about the same order of magnitude, even lower. Uh, as a success is this what Karin showed, the uh, dramatic uh, progression in the efficiency of, uh, of cars, which is the result of the regulation and the taxes that have been implemented. Uh, one failure is that everybody focused on cars but forgot uh, the other types of vehicles. As a result, in OECD countries where the share of cars is decreasing because it's the more uh, where there are the best uh, progress, uh, which means the share of uh, trucks, light duty vehicles is increasing in the consumption because there were less policies. And we should not forget that in developing countries, in emerging countries, uh, the weight of car is much less important than in OECD countries. So they are really, uh, it's really on the, on the transport of goods that the effort should be made. And this is not the case. Well, um, final success that we can say that there have been a, quite a good uh, package of measures and comprehensive uh, combined measures uh, to improve the efficiency of vehicles and cars. And fortunately, the, which correspond to the first type of measure in the graph I presented about the three levels of the policies. With respect to the second policy that was linked to uh, model shift, we can say that uh, they did not work. It is we can only see a slight impact in a few countries for passenger and for freight. It is really marginal. And there are few measures for reducing uh, the transport demand because it, it has to combine measures in uh, different areas, uh, like uh, uh, changing the urbanization pattern to have more density. And uh, this implies different policies from transport or energy policy. And this is what makes the complexity of the policies to be implemented in the transport sector. With respect to Europe, we have uh, quite detailed data and we are able to explain the decrease in the consumption of uh, transport. It is shown on the left for the total consumption for uh, goods and passengers and in the middle for the detail for goods and uh, on the right for, for passengers. But let's comment from the total consumption. It has decreased, uh, as shown by the red bar, by 30 million ton oil equivalent. It is no, no longer an increase, but it decreased since 2007, which is the start of the economic recession. But we could show that only 40% is explained by the economic recession, less traffic, which is shown by the blue bar, and about 60% is explained by energy efficiency, which is shown by the green uh, bar. All are negative, so they all contribute to reduce the consumption. Model shift had a, a marginal uh, effect for the moment. The green bar, which shows the impact of energy efficiency, mainly represents the savings for cars as Karin said, for road freight transport, the, the economic recession has a negative effect and actually uh, led to uh, negative saving in the sense that the truck were using proportionally more energy to carry one ton kilometer because of empty running and uh, because of uh, the fact they were not fully loaded. So this will conclude our presentation and now we can uh, go to the question. Thank you for your
Thank you very much, Bruno and Kareem, for those presentations. Um, as Bruno mentioned, we will move on now to the question and answer session of the uh, webinar. So if anyone in the audience does have any questions for the panelists, you may submit those in the question pane of the GoToWebinar window. We did receive quite a few questions already, so I'll go ahead and get started um, with the first one that we have. And that, that first question that actually came in before the webinar asked, what does the evolution in the efficiency in heavy trucks look like? And I know you touched on this in your presentations quite a bit, um, but maybe just a, a quick summary. Well, that's true. We, I presented a, a slide on the, the specific conception of uh, freight uh, transport that is mainly uh, that mainly construct concerns truck, and uh, we have seen that um, it is thus um, decreasing uh, since last decade. But uh, we can mention as well, and this is exactly what uh, Bruno just explained about this uh, load factors, which is really important in the freight transport. And uh, that is exp and explain this um, uh, the, the fact that uh, the, the specific consumption of uh, road freight increased uh, during the economic recession because the the truck were uh, not fully uh, they were half uh, empty uh, and thus uh, the 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 transport the ton um, of goods per kilometers uh, was. Uh, decreased and altered the efficiency of uh, freight uh, um, transport. Maybe Bruno, you want to uh, add something about this uh, truck uh, energy consumption? Well, the, the efficiency of truck is, can be uh, defined with different indicators. Usually we uh, relate the consumption to the ton kilometer carried and this is what uh, explained Karin and what was shown in the slide uh, previously. Uh, we can think also of the efficiency in liter per hundred kilometer, but this may be misleading because uh, a, 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 one factor behind this decrease in the specific consumption per ton kilometer is the fact that the trucks are bigger. Liter per hundred kilometers, they will consume more, but they will carry more. And we track like 50, 50 tons, like in the U.S., uh, compared to. Uh, trucks that are uh, much smaller on average in the emerging country, we, we, we cannot have the same efficiency. And thanks to the measures uh, I presented uh, to increase these load factors and to, uh, to increase the size of these big trucks and so on, of course it uh, improved the efficiency as well of the, the truck fleet. Great, thank you both. Um, moving on to the next question from the audience. Um, it's wondering if you have any insight or information on electric vehicles and very fast chargers and how they could influence electric vehicle development for highway use. Um, they do. They mentioned the the Kia Soul 100 kilowatt electric vehicle, but the uh, um, they're referencing the very fast chargers for EV vehicles. Well, there are a lot of hopes with electric vehicles, but for the moment uh, they are mainly conceived to be used on, uh, in urban areas. The, uh, their capacity is still not enough to, uh, to be used on long distance. Or uh, they will go through hybrid system, rechargeable hybrid, which is a mix of electric and uh, traditional engine. And that's true that uh, vehicles are often uh, linked to a smart grid, uh, which is uh, really uh, concentrated in rural area areas and urban, uh, urban. Um, sorry, urban <laughs> areas and concern uh, short distance, as uh, Bruno explained. And in Europe, in particular, the most of the the measures target uh, uh, are linked with uh, smart grids. Great. Thank you again. Um, so we had a few questions come in that are all slightly related, so I'm going to try to group them together. Um, and they are, they are a little broad questions, but they're asking for your, your opinion on this. So um, in your opinion, what are the best measures that you would suggest to implement for both the case of developing countries and measures that have the greatest potential for energy savings and greenhouse gas reductions?
So again, the best measures for developing countries, and in your opinion, the best measures to implement for energy savings and greenhouse gas reductions. Okay, I start and I'm sure that Bruno will complete. Uh, in developing countries, I think that the main issue is about car ownership that will increase drastically because the, the behavioral trends are going towards uh, one car per household. So uh, this is the main target of uh, energy uh, efficiency uh, measures and policies. So uh, to, to limit this uh, ownership uh, equipment increase, there is several, uh, uh, several measures. First of all, it's to promote uh, in still in urban areas the, the public transport and uh, in long transport to promote the train and high speed uh, uh, rail uh, train. Uh, we have some, uh, some uh, data that's showing that there is a great potential in China. Well, in India it is quite well developed, but uh, most uh, in, in China there is a lot of program on uh, high speed uh, rail. Um, so and then to uh, to tax uh, to tax uh, the and to put excess tax on cars or individual uh, passenger cars uh, and to promote alternative at the same time and uh, promote alternative uh, uh, or efficient uh, fuel uh, vehicles. Well, I can try to complement. Uh, for a developing country, we have to make a distinction between countries that produce cars and the countries that import cars. If they import cars, then uh, the, the measures that have been implemented in, uh, in OECD countries have to be adapted, for instance, by thinking of label for second-hand car or uh, possibly a minimum of energy efficiency standard for imported cars. This, uh, there are, to my mind, not really example of that. Some countries have done that for uh, electrical appliances, but uh, this could be uh, extended to, to cars. Whereas for car producing countries, well, the measures uh, that actually are already implemented in, uh, in China, Brazil can be also uh, important to be implemented in these countries. Then the second type of measure we have, we have to take into account that also buses represent a significant share of the consumption and part of these buses use energy in urban areas. Usually we have uh, inefficient bus, polluting bus, so the, one of the priority could be to, to shift, for instance, to uh, more efficient buses using uh, natural gas, compressed natural gas. A third priority, but this belongs to the second category of measure, which means it's long to implement and more difficult and more costly, is of course to develop uh, public transport like uh, we have in, uh, in European OECD, large cities in OECD countries. The development of, of this uh, rapid transit system are still uh, not uh, as, as developed as it should be. It could be rail transport, but it could be also a bus rapid system, which uh, reduces the cost of the infrastructure. And as a large potential, maybe the second question, but it will be related also to the first one. What we see in developing countries is that the majority of the freight is carried by medium trucks, because there are not big companies like in OECD countries. Uh, multitude of small companies with a limited number of trucks and that will tell the efficiency. So, uh, I don't know what type of policy should be implemented, but it's a matter of organization of the transport system that should rely on bigger companies and on bigger trucks to improve the, the efficiency of the system. Thank you, Bruno and Crane. Uh, next question is, um, it came in during the beginning of the webinar, and you did touch it on it a little bit, but what standard requirements, uh, most of these standard requirements they note, apply when dealing with secondhand cars?
I think there are really few requirements uh, in terms of standards. What, what exists uh, for second hand cars is limit as to the age of the car that are allowed to be imported in a country. So it has some impact of efficiency if you, if you pro prohibit the import of cars that are more than five years old, of course, uh, they will be more efficient than very old cars. But um, I, I don't uh, see any other, other examples in that respect. And as I said, this is something that has to be addressed. Great, thank you, Bruno. Uh, we can move on to the next question, uh, which this attendee wanted to know. They, they note that they're from Trinidad and Tobago, where they now have a few incentives for more efficient vehicles. And they'd like to ask if any work has been done on what they're calling the rebound effect, otherwise known as the Javon paradox. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, they're wondering what policy measures can be used to address or combat this. Uh, what you are saying that uh, in, in Trinidad and Tobago and other countries there are efficiency standards, but uh, the rebound effect is that by uh, driving more, the uh, user will spend the same amount of money. Uh, this is what usually is, uh, is, is called the rebound effect. Right, and yeah. We believe the best policy to, to limit the rebound effect is to have uh, high energy prices. <laughs> If you have very low energy price and the standard, it's clear that, well, since the price were already low, I, I don't think it will have a big impact in terms of rebound effect. But it could have an impact, and the only way to remove the rebound effect is to have uh, uh, incentive prices. And uh, we have, uh, on, in appendix of, the, of the, the presentation, you will see that there is a, a decomposition of the energy uh, trends where well, we split with the distance effect and in some countries uh, we see that uh, there is a trend toward uh, a decrease in uh, annual uh, distance traveled uh, by, by car. Even if in in indeed uh, there is a standard that limits the consumption per, per, per liter, per kilometers and so on. So uh, uh, I think that um, this rebound effect is uh, is limited and it's more limited by the fact that there is an increase of uh, taxes in fuel prices. Yeah, what, what happened actually is that at the same time the standards were implemented, there was an increase in the price of uh, international oil, oil, which in OECD countries were reflected on the consumer. And this explained uh, most of the decrease in the, in the car, uh, the, the distance traveled by car. So actually, we, we, we did not have a rebound effect. We had uh, uh, the reverse phenomenon. People <laughs> purchased more efficient cars, and at the same time, they drove less. But this could change now that we have low price, but we don't have enough history to, to, to measure it. And there is as well these behavioral changes where, uh, at least in OECD countries or in Europe, where uh, people, uh, they, uh, they try to use less uh, individual cars and so on, uh, driven by all these uh, policies, but as well from their, their behavioral, uh, from their behaviors and, uh, yeah, willingness to, uh, to leave the, the cars. Great, thank you again. Uh, next question that we had. Uh, is talking about uh, energy and CO2 labeling. Uh, they're wondering what are some of the easiest ways to make energy and CO2 labeling for vehicles mandatory to help raise public awareness? And are, are there any examples of that? Well, it has to be initiative of uh, the government, by the way, so to be mandatory, uh, Maybe in some developing country there is a step where we've seen that in India, for instance, or in Brazil, I don't, I don't remember, there is a, a first step to implement voluntary uh, labeling uh, and then make them uh, mandatory. And then, as I explained, uh, to enforce this, uh, these standards is to, uh, to, uh, to ask uh, manufacturers to pay a, a fee or a fine if they do not respect the standards.
Well, in, ter in terms of labeling, clearly, uh, for, from the consumer point of view, uh, energy labeling is more efficient than CO2 labeling because it's uh, easier to understand uh, uh, the measurement in liter or miles per gallon or kilometer per liter than in CO2. And uh, another way to make it attractive, understandable for the consumer is to express it in terms of money spent, which is uh, what some countries uh, impose, like New Zealand and UK, where you have both consumption in a liter of miles per gallon, but also in uh, in dollar or pound. Mm. We understand. And as well, sorry, in terms of uh, acceptability, uh, uh, what we said is that uh, these uh, labels can be uh, fixed according to uh, any other type of uh, labeling, like uh, we did in uh, in Europe with the appliances, where the labels are quite are quite similar from one product to another, so that it increases acceptability of the end users and it is the comprehension of the of the of the label. Thank you again. Uh, next question from our attendees. Ask, uh, they note that scrappage schemes in similar schemes go against the impetus to encourage socioeconomic development in poorer countries. What has worked best in these contexts where public transport services and infrastructure are weak, thereby pushing the incentive to own private vehicles and road for freight? Are you saying that there is a trade-off uh, between a scrappage that give incentive uh, for individual cars while they, at the same time they are promoting um, public transport? Are you asking a, a question about this trade-off or I misunderstand? Yes, exactly. About the trade-off. Well, uh, on one side uh, the scrappage scheme aims to uh, increase the average uh, efficiency of the car fleet. That's right. And that's right as well that uh, it will not give uh, uh, incentive to uh, public transport. But I'm not sure there is a direct link because uh, use, uh, uses are different. And um, if you uh, develop a public transport in uh, urban areas and you make difficult the access to cars, I mean, uh, it will uh, have no impact, uh, the scrappage is on the, the promotion of uh, public transport. Uh, by the way, scrappage scheme have been implemented for trucks also in some countries, uh, especially in Latin America, I think in Chile and uh, in Colombia, to, to give incentives to the truck owner to replace their old truck with the more efficient trucks. But uh, that was not the question. Uh, about the question uh, scrappage scheme for car, we, we can have an innovative scheme where you give money to the, to the car owner to not only to replace his car but to get rid of his car in exchange of a subsidy or in exchange to a subscription to public transport, something like this. I, I think there are examples of this type. So, car scrapping doesn't necessarily mean that you give money to replace the car. It can be also to get rid of an efficient car and having a, a subsidy to, for using public transport. Uh, exactly. This is what I mentioned during the presentation and it is implemented in, uh, in uh, Canada and Italy that rather than uh, subsidizing a new car purchase, they promote, uh, they provide public transport allowances. And next question um, notes that you mentioned that energy efficiency for transport should focus on freight rather than cars in emerging markets. So what's the order of magnitude of the energy consumption between that sector, the heavy duty vehicles, versus cars, light duty personal, personal vehicles? Uh, 
Well, the difficulty is that the, the transport sector is very poorly known in uh, emerging countries. So it's why we only give data for OECD countries saying car represents 50% of the consumption. But we know that in emerging countries it's not true. But there are really few countries which are able to, uh, to, to, to break down the consumption of, uh, of road transport, for instance, by type of vehicle, what is consumed by trucks, by uh, cars, and so on. Uh, we are working in a project on, in Latin America that we did not mention. It's called the BEA. Uh, it's uh, Energy Efficiency Indicator Project for Latin American countries, where we are looking at this question. It is sponsored by ADEM and, and CEPAL ECLAC, the U United Commission for Latin America. So you're on the internet, you can find information on that. And we were not able to, to get really data about uh, this uh, breakdown of the consumption of road transport. I remember only one country, Chile, but it is among the be most developed in Latin America. It's part of OECD, so it's not really an emerging country. And they were able to, to break down the consumption by type of vehicle. And like that, you, you could see that trucks represent a significant share of the consumption as well as buses and car are not so important. Thank you, Bruno. Um, next question from our attendee. They wanted to start by thanking you for the presentations and for sharing your experiences. Um, and they also note that the presentation was mainly concentrated on G20 and selected BRICS countries. Um, as for the small and least developing countries, uh, they note Nepal and uh, others in South Asia and Sub-Saharan African countries. The transport sector energy consumption and demand are quite different. So for transport policies in these countries, technical efficiency is exogenous as they are imported. Could you please share your thoughts, suggestions on future transport energy efficiency policies that are non-technical? Happy to repeat that if you need me to. What do you call exogenous? I'm sorry? What you mentioned exogenous, no? Ex exogenous, yeah, the, they're just, um, so they're noting that the techno technical efficiency is exogenous since the cars are imported, they're not manufactured in country. We, we, we try to answer to that. First of all, they will benefit from the fact that the uh, exporting countries will produce more efficient vehicles, so if they import uh, new vehicles, the new vehicle will be more efficient just because of the technical progress in other countries. In but uh, they could uh, receive the uh, vehicles that are not allowed anymore in the road in the countries with uh, strict standards. So they, they could add up to receive the, some uh, less efficient second-hand vehicles. So this, goes to the comments we made about having measures on the second-hand vehicles. This answer part of your question. I don't know if it's... Uh, if there was another part? Um, you refer to non-technical measures. But I would right. say non-technical measures are the most difficult to, to implement, as we, we explained. And even in OECD countries, we are not able to, we are not very proud of the result with non-technical measures. What has been successful are technical measures. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I, yeah, I think that addresses it. Thank you, Bruno. Um, we'll kind of shift uh, topics a little bit now. Um, one of our attendees is wondering how you see the development of natural gas in transport, specifically for North America, Europe, and China. Well, there are great expectations as to the development of, uh, of gas in, uh, in transport, especially in the States, uh, because of the availability of, of gas, and there are plans to shift all, everything to natural gas, trains, trucks, uh, so it is possible that this will take place. In Europe, I don't think uh, 
we, we, we have the same availability of gas and uh, the less, less, less expectation on that side. In Europe, we are more uh, focusing on reducing CO2 emissions, so looking at uh, biofuels, uh, because they, they, they don't emit uh, CO2 according to the calculations of, of emissions. And to give some insight about the, the trends, I, I can um, uh, update uh, the slide number nine that uh, Bruno uh, described uh, on the share of alternative fuels. And I can add the split according to electric, biofuel, and natural gas, natural gas sorry, so that we'll be able to see the evolution in each uh, country and the, the share of natural gas, natural gas in particular. So I will improve that slide so that you will give uh, data. Right, and again, if the attendees want access to the slides, you can go to cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash um, training, and the slides are available for download out there as well. Uh, we have a couple questions left that we'll try to get to. We are running towards the end of our time, um, so maybe just some uh, briefer answers for these if, if possible. Um, one question notes that most modeling on transport energy needs focuses on urban transport. They're wondering, what's the share of urban transport need in total passenger transport? Um, obviously, that's going to be different country to country. Uh, but what are the similarity and differences in terms of transport demand in fuel efficiency between urban passenger transport and total passenger transport? It's very difficult to get uh, yeah. <laughs> on that. even on the traffic, even speaking about the speed of the energy consumption, even on traffic we, we have uh, little data. Uh, as I mentioned, this project covering all Latin American countries, we discovered that data on traffic are, uh, do not exist in most of the countries. You know, they don't know what is the traffic of freight, for instance, by road. By rail, of course, it is easy to, to to know it, but uh, there, there is little traffic by the, by rail, and about the traffic by uh, by truck, uh, it's not well known. I would say now for for passengers, uh, urban transport is probably the uh, represents the majority because first of all, the same vehicle used in urban area compared to a non-urban area will consume more per. Uh, kilometer or per mile driven because they, will, they are less efficient than when used in, in urban area, especially if there are a lot of congestion. So this will really uh, contribute to, to increase the share of urban transport. For freight, I would say uh, majority would be intercity transportation and transportation from factories to city, but not really urban transportation. So the picture is different for freight and for uh, for uh, passenger. Thank you, Bruno. Um, and I guess uh, one one last question that would might do a nice job of uh, summarizing some of the points that you've had so far. Uh, what do we need to support more of a modal shift in transportation? I, I think, okay, uh, you, you can make all information you want uh, to promote uh, public transport or uh, the use of uh, rail transport for, uh, for freight. <coughs> for, for passenger, what is important is the quality of the service. If you have crowded public transport uh, or that are not punctual at all, nobody will rely on it. If you have good quality public transport that are, go faster than car, people will use the public transport without uh, additional uh, policy. So the, the answer is really to improve the quality of the public transport. And it, it includes, Security, everything. And it includes cycle lines as well. <laughs> Depending on the climate. Yeah, but uh, at, uh, anyway, the, 
the cities has to take into account yes, the services and uh, the security as Bruno mentioned. So the difficulty of model ship is that it has to go through infrastructure. Infrastructure means uh, investment that takes time, that costs money and uh, they are never the priority. But this, this should be the priority, the long-term priority. And public-private public partnership can be considered for that. Great. Thank you very much. We are uh, almost out of time now, so we'll go ahead and, and wrap up the webinar. Um, uh, to the attendees that submitted questions that maybe we didn't have time to get to, um, I do apologize for that, but I will forward those along to our panelists and they um, give them the option of answering through email directly to you. Um, so at this point, we'd like to ask um, to, for your help in completing our survey so that we may evaluate how we're doing and improve for future webinars. So the first statement uh, is the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight and just select the option that you uh, uh, expresses your opinion. Strongly agree, agree, not sure, disagree, or strongly disagree. And next question is the webinar's presenters were effective. And then the final one, overall the webinar met my expectations. Great, thank you very much for answering our survey. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd like to just thank again our expert panelists, Bruno and Kareem, and also to our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We very much appreciate everyone's time, and I invite the attendees to check the Solutions Center website if you'd like to view the slides, download them, or listen to a recording of today's broadcast, as well as any previously held webinars. Um, additionally, you will find information on upcoming webinars and other training events. And just a reminder, we are also posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Please allow for about one week for the audio recordings to be posted. And we also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solutions Center resources and services, including the no-cost Ask an Expert policy support. And with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And this concludes our webinar.